this video we will discuss the pathology of polycystic ovarian syndrome firstly we will see the definition and understand its pathophysiology then we will see the clinical features after that we will learn about the diagnosis and at the end we will learn the morphology this polycystic ovarian syndrome so let's start with the definition you can see the word polycystic ovarian syndrome is itself self explanatory it is the disorder that is characterized by development of multiple cysts in the ovary so the definition is ovarian disorder characterized by formation of multiple subcortical ovarian cysts now let's discuss the pathophysiology so the pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome is complex and it is considered as a vicious cycle so let me explain so just like most of the disorders that are acquired these polycystic ovarian syndrome are also caused by interaction between bad genes and bad dietary habits or you can say obesity so genetics and diet or obesity interact to play this pathogenesis of polycystic ovarian syndrome so the first hormonal disturbance in the polycystic ovarian syndrome is decrease in fsh and increase in lh so fsh to lh ratio is overall decreased remember decrease in fsh and increase in lh now why does this happen it cannot be fully explained by this genetics and diet obesity or obesity rather you can see that if you progress through this cycle the cycle itself results in decrease fsh and increase lh so you can say that this disorder gives birth to itself it can be considered as a vicious cycle in which once these abnormalities develop once these endocrine abnormalities develop they can cause a vicious cycle of self propagation so let's proceed further so the main problem is decrease in fsh and increase in lh luteinizing hormone now you know that increase in luteinizing hormone induces the development of androgens so androgens level will be increased this is an important part of pathophysiology now as the androgens are being produced in great quantity you know that in women there is an enzyme called aromatase that convert androgens into the estrogens so increased quantity of androgens will also be converted into the estrogen so estrogen will be also be increased in quantity so this disorder has caused an increase in both androgens as well as estrogens now let's see what happens further so if there are a lot of estrogens these estrogens will cause feedback inhibition of fsh so fsh will be decreased and we studied in the beginning that fsh low fsh was the beginning of all these endocrine abnormalities and again after the cycle propagated it again resulted in decrease in fsh so in this way this is a vicious cycle in which the dis disorder progresses itself now let's see what are the effect of decrease in fsh so if there is no follicular stimulating hormone then the process of growth of follicles will not be proper and most of the cycles will become anovulatory why they become anovulatory one reason is that there is lack of follicular stimulating hormone so follicles are not being stimulated enough and as the luteinizing hormone is constantly being high rather than the normal physiology of decrease in luteinizing hormone and then sudden lh surge that brings about ovulation so the hormonal disturbance like this can cause anovulation so anovulatory cycles are one of the very important feature of polycystic ovarian syndrome now what happens if the ovulation does not happen if the ovulation does not happen then obviously egg will not be released this will cause infertility so in patients of polycystic ovarian syndrome most of the cycles are anovulatory resulting in infertility infertility is a very important feature of polycystic ovarian syndrome and as the process of ovulation is not there so the follicles become cyst like in appearance so these follicular cysts are actually the abnormal follicles that have failed to ovulate so in the ovaries of polycystic ovarian syndrome you will see multiple follicular cysts now another important consequence of anovulation is lack of progesterone how does it happen you know whenever ovulation happens the remaining part of follicle is converted into the corpus luteum that secretes progesterone but now as ovulation is not happening so follicle will not be converted into the corpus luteum and there will be lack of progesterone now what does this lack of progesterone cause this lack of progesterone causes an increase in luteinizing hormone from the pituitary because this is a feedback cycle if there is more progesterone it causes inhibition of luteinizing hormone but as less progesterone is produced so it will cause an increase in luteinizing hormone and we studied in the beginning the increase in luteinizing hormone was one of the part of pathogenesis it was the beginning of this problem 
So again, this disorder is self-propagating itself. Now let me summarize the pathophysiology once again. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is caused by an interaction of genetics and obesity. This can cause decrease in FSH and increase in LH. Increase in luteinizing hormone brings about an increase in the level of androgens and these androgens are converted by aromatase into the estrogens. This increased quantity of estrogens causes feedback inhibition of FSH follicular stimulating hormone and due to the lack of effect of FSH, ovulation does not progress efficiently and due to anovulatory cycles, this results in infertility and follicular cysts. And because of the anovulation or lack of ovulation, the corpus luteum is not formed resulting in decrease in progesterone. This decrease in progesterone causes an upsurge of luteinizing hormone. Now let's discuss the clinical features of polycystic ovarian syndrome and we will correlate this with the pathophysiology. So the first important point about polycystic ovarian syndrome was that it was favored by obesity and bad diet. So you know that obesity also increases the risk of hyperinsulinemia that is in a state of insulin resistance or diabetes. So hyperinsulinemia or diabetes can coexist with the polycystic ovarian syndrome and remember that this hyperinsulinemia or diabetes has bilateral interaction with the pathophysiology of this disease. In a way that hyperinsulinemia or diabetes favor the development of polycystic ovarian syndrome of these endocrine abnormalities and once the polycystic ovarian syndrome develops, it increases the risk of diabetes. So diabetes has bilateral interaction with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So diabetes is one of the conditions that need to be prevented aggressively in cases of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Secondly, we discussed that in polycystic ovarian syndrome, there was an increase in androgens level. And you know, androgens are the normal male hormones. So an increase in androgens will cause acne and hirsutism. Hirsutism means development of hair on face. So acne and hirsutism that are the characteristic of increased androgens will result in females. So acne and hirsutism are important part of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Thirdly, as these androgens bring about an increase in level of estrogen because of aromatase enzyme, the increase in estrogens will cause endometrial hyperplasia and this endometrial hyperplasia can result in endometrial carcinoma. So remember, uterine carcinomas are also more likely in patients of polycystic ovarian syndrome. After that, we studied that polycystic ovarian syndrome causes anovulation due to the lack of FSH. And as I already discussed, when the ov ovulation does not happen, this results in infertility. So infertility is an other important feature of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And obviously, follicular cysts will be formed, which will be found in a patient of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Lastly, there is decrease in progesterone. Now, why this is important? Because, you know, progesterone is a hormone that stabilizes the endometrium. You know that normal menstrual cycle is caused by a cyclical interaction of estrogen and progesterone. Both of these hormones are necessary. Estrogen causes the proliferation of endometrium while progesterone stabilizes the endometrium. Then after the progesterone level falls in the menstrual cycle, the endometrium is shed resulting in menses. Now if there is no progesterone, so there will be an increase in estrogen to progesterone ratio. So the endometrium will over proliferate as we discussed that it also causes endometrial hyperplasia. And this increase in proliferation of endometrium will cause heavy menstrual bleeding whenever it bleeds. So due to the thickened and hyperplastic endometrium, you will see heavy menstrual bleeding also contributed by decrease in progesterone. Secondly, as the estrogen and progesterone are not being interacting in a cyclic way, so this lack of proper sequencing of these hormones result in amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea. So women of polycystic ovarian syndrome have their menses not in a regular cycle, rather they can be delayed for three or four months. This is called oligomenorrhea and sometimes if the menses stop completely, we call this as amenorrhea. So remember that the disturbance in balance of estrogen and progesterone can cause heavy menstrual bleeding and amenorrhea. So let me summarize the clinical features, hyperinsulinemia or diabetes, acne or hirsutism, endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma, infertility and heavy menstrual bleeding and amenorrhea. Now let's discuss the diagnosis. So for diagnosis we have a criteria. In this criteria there are three important points and if two out of these three points are fulfilled we will label as polycystic ovarian syndrome. One is oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea which we discussed as a clinical feature. Second is excess androgen activity. For this excess androgen activity to be proven you can use biochemical tests 
or you can see the symptoms of these excess androgens that is acne or hirsutism so you need some biochemical or clinical evidence of excess androgen activities and thirdly you need to see polycystic ovaries on ultrasound so these three are the features if two of them are present then we can diagnose as polycystic ovarian syndrome remember these three features oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea excess androgen activity and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound now let's discuss the morphology as far as the gross features are concerned they are very simple to remember that you will see large ovaries with numerous subcortical cysts as implied by the name polycystic ovarian syndrome you will see multiple cysts and as far as the microscopic features are concerned the keywords to remember for polycystic ovarian syndrome are multiple follicular cysts caused by failure to ovulate accompanied by endocrine abnormalities you know that is pretty much summarizes the pathogenesis or pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome that there are multiple follicular cysts that are caused by failure of ovulation and this is accompanied by endocrine abnormalities so let's translate this into a microscopic picture the first keyword is multiple follicular cysts so you will see multiple follicular cysts in the subcortical region and these will be covered by dense fibrous capsule the second keyword is caused by failure to ovulate you know whenever the ovulation happens it results in formation of corpus luteum but as this is caused by a failure to ovulate so you will see absence of corpus luteum this is an important feature of polycystic ovaries the third important microscopic feature is accompanied by endocrine abnormalities what does this suggest this suggests increased thickness of theca cells in follicles you know that theca cells in the follicles are active hormone producing cells and as polycystic ovarian syndrome also is accompanied by endocrine abnormalities so corresponding to that you will see increased thickness of theca cells that will cause an increase in amount of these hormones so remember these three microscopic features you will see multiple follicular cysts you will see absence of corpus luteum and you will see increased thickness of theca cells in the follicle so this concludes the pathology of polycystic ovarian syndrome